All right, well, uh, let me now officially start and say welcome uh, to this call. Uh, a good icy weird weather morning to everybody. My name is Inga Andreessen and I am the chair of the Ontario Justice Education Network Halton Committee. It is really rare for lawyers to go to the Supreme Court of Canada and I knew that when I heard a Halton law firm was going to be going to argue an appeal, it was a great chance for all Halton students to read materials and hear about the case before it was argued and decided. So today I'm excited to have joining us Fareen Jamal and Fadwa Yahia. They are co-counsel and they're at Jamal Family Law. They are going to speak to you on the case known as F. VN, and they're going to talk to you about why we're talking initials. It will be argued before the Supreme Court of Canada on April the 12th. Now, we agreed uh, before we started talking that we weren't going to do long introductions, but let me just say that both Fareen and Fadwa and myself went to Osgoode Hall Law School, mm -hmm. um, and that Fareen and Fadwa met at Osgoode Hall and have both of them have gone on to uh, significant careers in family law um, throughout Ontario. So the format for today is going to be that Farine and Fadwa are going to be chatting with us about the case. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I will be raising them throughout the discussion. And I want everyone to know that this is going to be recorded. It will only be posted on the OGEN website after April 12th, when the argument is concluded uh, before the Supreme Court. So teachers, this is a resource that you can use on an ongoing basis. Um, and so without any further ado, uh, Fareen, Fadwa, welcome. And I'd like to invite you to start by telling us, how did you come to be involved in the case that is FVN? Well, a long time ago, uh, we got a phone call. Uh, I got a phone call from another family lawyer, much like Inga who said, uh, I have a complicated case that I think you could manage from. Do you think you could take this on? And I heard her case and I was involved in some other stuff. And I said, I have just a lawyer for you. And I said, this is perfect. I'm gonna send this right over to Miss Yahia uh, and, and we'll take on the file, but Fadwa will be spearheading this one. And uh, she has the capacity to take it to trial quite quickly. And Fadwa, why didn't you tell them about um, <laughs> case managing this in what, from July to November, it was right. in trial. So when uh, I got this file, I was actually on vacation. And so uh, <laughs> that's a note that if you're ever on vacation, don't pick up a call from <laughs> Uh, another one, another, <laughs> don't pick up work calls while you're on vacation. So the, when we're talking about, um, international uh, abductions or moving children across borders. The timeline for cases moves, uh, I would say at breakneck speed. So normally a case start to finish takes on average about two years. You'd say that's a fair assessment for in about two years. Um, so um, what we do in those circumstances is we ended up starting, uh, we were served with materials. The father started the case as opposed to the mother who is in Ontario with the children. And he brought an application to have them return to the United Arab Emirates. So um, we went from an application in court to the first step in proceedings, which is a case conference in family matters. Um, and then from a case conference to a settlement conference, which is the next step, we did some questioning in between uh, just to figure out some of the information between the parties that would be relevant to this case. Uh, so that we could take appropriate positions. And then from a settlement conference or an attempt to resolve the issues amicably without going to trial, we went to trial right away. So this case started in um, August and we were in trial in November and it was an 11 day matter. So literally just a couple of months, we did some questioning in October, we appointed experts, we had a, a child psychologist and two uh, UAE uh, law experts uh, appointed as well. Um, and, and so the, the speed with which we went to trial was a very short turnaround time. So that's how we ended up in trial. And then before we knew it, we had our trial in November. November 
and we the judge miraculously yeah honestly he must have worked day and night because our trial ended like November 26th yeah and he gave us the decision and a 181 page decision December 15th so he must have he must also have worked at breakneck speed and and it was a comprehensive I mean 181 pages but it was com- you know yeah. well thought through and comprehensive so then to go from December 15th, right before the Christmas holidays, after just coming off an 11 day trial, which itself feels like exam period, you know, times 100. So you're really tired. And then working through the Christmas holidays, because then the appeal was our appeal stuff was due January 7th. So just to pause there, we I've lost. Gone, ju- no, yes. We lost. Right? <laughs> so. We lost at the trial. Yes. And- I'm jumping ahead. And And so then there was the appeal that happened in January. So I was just sort of talking about how quick, how how compressed this has been. And so that, so the trial was in November of 2020. That's right. Okay. All right. So just to put the time frame there. Okay. And so when you're talking a trial, just really briefly, November, 2020, we're talking COVID times because who doesn't love COVID times? It's the best. Um, So was this an in-person trial or was this a virtual trial? It was a virtual trial. There was a conversation at the time about doing it hybrid. Uh, Remember that dad is in the UAE. Uh, The foreign experts are in the UAE. So there's definitely some foreign um, witnesses anyways that were going to be by Zoom. We were going to have mom um, testify in person. And the day that she was, there, there was restrictions about how many people could physically be in court. And I think it was 10 people or eight people. And when we counted the lawyers, just on it because there was, you know, interveners with the AG and just if you count the number of lawyers and we were exceeding the 10 count as it was. So let's pause there just for a moment because you use the word intervener. And I mean, you and I as lawyers, we know interveners, uh, you know, nosy busybodies who are given legal status, but uh, the, uh, the students aren't going to understand what an intervener is or how they come into a case. So can you, one of you just break down for us, what is an intervener and how did they even find out about this case to get involved in the case? And at what stage did they get involved? So, so, yeah, I was was just going to say simply that because we raised constitutional law issues, Farine's going to give you the definition of intervener. No, no, go ahead. um, because Because we had constitutional law issues, uh, that were uh, part of our application. Um, the um, Attorney General for Ontario uh, is we are required to serve them and we're required to give them notice that there are constitutional issues. And so that's how they uh, became involved. So we had them at the um, trial stage and we had them at the appeal stage. We also had at the appeal stage, but not at the trial stage, the office of the children's lawyer. So that's, um, you know, counsel that's usually appointed for children. It's a government agency. And they uh, they were present uh, also to uh, raise issues with respect to children and children's rights at the appeal stage. So uh, we have more interveners now, but Marine will get Well, on April 12th, there will be the Office of the Children's Lawyer that's intervening, the Attorney General of Ontario that's intervening, and three other people asked to intervene. Um, the Defending Children International is an, is an organization that asked to intervene. The Canadian Council for Muslim Women asked to intervene. And the Barbara Schleifer Clinic asked to intervene. And they ask by putting in what's called a motion for leave to intervene. And then the court says yay or nay. And the Supreme Court of Canada responded and allowed two of those three in. They didn't allow the Barbara Schleifer Clinic in, but they did allow the other two in. So on the 12th, you'll get to see, in addition to us and Father's Council arguing, you'll also get to see four other interveners. Um, The Attorney General and Office of the Children's Lawyer only get 10 minutes. We each get an hour on the 12th. Together, we get an hour and the other side gets an hour. But um, the Office of the Children's Lawyer and the Attorney General each get 10 minutes and the other two only get five minutes. But they've been given the opportunity to put in written arguments as well. Uh, 10 pages uh, or something to that effect. So they've also been able to put forward their position. But to be an intervener, really, you just have to say, I have an interest in this case, and this is why I have an interest in the case. Can you please let me have a say? Before you make a decision, you need to hear what I have to say. In MNH, which was the same-sex marriage case at the Supreme Court of Canada, there was a fellow who said, um, 
I, I, I am in a same sex marriage or I'm in a same sex relationship. It wasn't a marriage yet. And so I'd like to be an intervener because this is going to affect my life. And the court said, yeah, you're welcome. So there were a lot of interveners. So it really depends. Often they like a body to speak for lots of individuals, but you know, you'd be surprised. So if you think that you're, you have a voice, would like a voice, you can ask to be an intervener and the court will say yay or nay. Just one other point with respect to that, um, interveners aren't allowed to speak to the merits of mm -hmm. the case, so they can't weigh in on the actual substantive issues, but they can talk about broad-based issues that are of concern, um, which is why they're intervening, right? They're giving voice to other individuals who may be similarly situated or have um, policy concerns that uh, that they want to highlight. Or impacted, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like impacted by the decision that's gonna be made. Right. So, so when you um, were unsuccessful at trial and went to the court of appeal, um, the, the children and the mother were in Canada, right? Was there a concern that they would have to immediately go back to the United Arab Emirates in light of the decision of the trial judge? So right after it had happened, um, in fact, before we even finished reading the decision, I think two hours afterwards, dad's counsel had written to say, okay, dad's on his way to come get the kids. And we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, we haven't even finished reading the decisions. <laughs> um, and so we said, look, we're intending to appeal right away. Um, will you agree to stay the, ma the matter? And so at that stage, we'd had a conversation to say, they had said, look, if you manage to bring it on quickly, if, if you get a condition, Against timeline, we will consent to this at stay so you don't have to argue it. And at the Court of Appeal, they have a case management judge who manages these. So Justice Bonato took that on for us. Um, and Justice Bonato sort of case managed it to say, okay, how quickly, how, you know, so she sort of um, engineered how some of that worked. So we didn't have to argue a stay. So they said, fine, the children can stay here, provided the appeal is heard, you know, before the end of January. So the appeal was heard, I think it was January 19th or 21st, 21st. 21st. Um, and so then there was this timeline for all of the materials that had to go in before that. And provided that that happened, they said we wouldn't have to argue a stay. Now, this, it, that's not what happened after the Court of Appeal. We did argue a stay after the Court of Appeal, but that's at that stage, we had agreed to keeping them here. Now, at the Court of Appeal in Ontario, which is not the same as the Supreme Supreme Court of Canada. So at the Court of Appeal in Ontario, you said you argued a constitutional issue as well as the what we're seeing in the Supreme Court of Canada materials, which is um, the best interest of the child argument as, as I'm understanding it as a business lawyer. So just briefly, I know the constitutional issue, the Supreme Court said, we're not going to hear you on that. But I know a lot of grade 12 students on this call are studying Canadian constitutional law in their grade 12 law class. So just out of curiosity, but not to spend a lot of time on it, what was the constitutional issue that was before the Court of Appeal? So, in fact, it was before the trial court. So, so let me start with, you know, there was the trial court, there was the Court of Appeal, and then there was, now we're going to Superior Court of Canada, and this is our last chance to keep these children in this country, right? This is our last chance to make sure these children aren't separated from their mother. But at the very first level, at the trial level, we made a number of arguments. Um, several of them, right, that about atonement, whether he had atoned to the jurisdiction, what we call a 22 argument to 22A, which is that they're habitually, whether they're habitually resident here because the mother is here and they're so tightly, tightly connected to her. There's what we call a 221B. So it's all the ways that we're asking Ontario to assume jurisdiction. So a 221B argument is Ontario can assume jurisdiction, even if the children are not habitually resident, if you can meet these six factors real and substantial connection, that there's no pending proceeding somewhere else, like all of these other factors that we needed to meet here. So we said, we're even under that, we're going to give that a shot. Your next soldier is a 23 argument, which is serious harm, which is which is the one that we're going to now, right? That there's serious harm if they, if they get removed from Ontario. Our fourth argument would be what's called parents patriot, which is a sex, section 69 although section 25 of the CLRA also has some of that because it's the forum non-convenience and then our fifth argument sort of like as each soldier falls is the constitutional arguments and there's two there's three sort of angles for them the first one is ultra virus 
that the legislation that removing children out of Ontario is removing anybody is deporting, so to speak, or akin to that. And in that sense, only federal, it can only happen under federal statutes. That okay, the so are, so yeah. when we use the word ultra-virus, <laughs> that is a, lo a word as lawyers we're used to hearing, but and the students may be familiar with it, but it means outside of the law, I think is, is a good way of expressing it, at least that's how I understand it. So I just yeah. wanted to interpret there um, yeah. uh, for the students, so outside of the law. That Sorry. only federal statutes could do that, that that's a federal power that provinces don't have that power. And so the provincial legislation couldn't do that. So that was one of the constitutional arguments. And then some of the other constitutional arguments were that these return powers were contrary to, you know, um, when you think of the charter arguments, there's a number of different charters, uh, sections that are implicated. Um, section six, which is the right of the citizen to live, reside and be here. Section seven, uh, section 15, which is about discrimination about gender and age because of the law of the UAE being gendered. So there were different charter sections that we'd gone under as well. And then, um, gosh, what was the last? I think that may have been it. Th those were them, yeah. The charter arguments. And so the Supreme Court of Canada, so we did that at both level one and the Court of Appeal level two. And when we asked for leave at the third level at the Supreme Court, they said, we just want to hear the arguments about the section 23 and the implications of uh, 23 and 40 and the implications of best interests and what so just allowed yeah, section 23 and 40 are sections of the children's law reform act that's okay right. that's, yeah that's All the provincial we're... statute that governs yeah. uh these matters right so and there are and there are two types of law like two types of um legislative pieces or within the CLRA because Ontario has adopted it. So it's a complicated, just to sort of uh, situate what Farine was saying, the section 40 um, part of the Children's Law Reform Act is the return provision, right? So if you can't find serious harm or you can't find that the children are habitually resident, you return them under uh, section 40. And that's where we were saying, look, the province can't return children. That's a federal power, not a provincial power. And so you're not allowed to do it. You can't deport children. So in, uh, at the trial stage and at the Court of Appeal stage, they were like, no, no, yes, we can. We can do it as a function of, you know, how we make decisions about children, right? So, okay, so at the Court of Appeal then, so you were unsuccessful at the Court of Appeal. Yes. But yet we could see in your appeal materials, there was something called a dissenting judge. So can you just talk to us about who you argued? I mean, obviously we're gonna focus on Supreme Court of Canada, but who were the judges you argued in front of at the Court of Appeal of Ontario? And what is a dissenting judge and why do we see it so much in your materials as the appellant? So um, it's a hard thing to lose. <laughs> so when you, their decisions come out uh, from the Court of Appeal, there, it's a panel of three judges. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, Justice Horrigan, Justice Brown, and Justice Lowers. So Justice Horrigan had, on the uh, review of the appeal, decided that the children should return to the UAE. He upheld the uh, trial judge's decision to return the children to the UAE with or without their mother. Um, and then Justice Brown went through the constitutional arguments for a second in time and said, no, the trial judge correctly uh, interpreted and applied them. And this is not ultra-virus. Section 40 is not outside of the powers of uh, the Provincial Act. And uh, it's not contrary to any of the charter rights of the mother or the children. And then Justice Lowers said, you know what, I don't agree. I don't agree. He didn't comment actually on the constitutional issues, but he did comment on Justice Horrigan's um, response that the children children should return. And so he disagreed. So it was basically two to one. So we take the dissent, which is so he dissents means I don't agree with what the other two judges have uh, decided. And so it's not a unanimous decision. And on that basis, we took the commentary of Justice Lowers and, um, and turned it into the grounds for our appeal. Um, because we believe that he understood the legal issues as we had uh, effectively framed them, which is that 
um, mother should be able to remain in Ontario with these children, because if we return them, then they would indeed suffer serious harm under Section 23. And even if you didn't find that there was harm under Section 23, the best interest of the children, if considered properly under Section 40, which is the return provision, would have allowed the judges to keep the children here. Because Section 40 says you don't have to return them to their habitual residence, to their real home, to the last place they came from, it says to an appropriate place. And so that signals for us that a judge would look at the best interest of the children and say, okay, I'm going to send them to a place that's appropriate for them. Um, and that's what Justice Lauer said. And in his finding, he said, I think there is serious harm and therefore these children should remain in the province of Ontario. So that was the basis of our appeal to the Supreme Court and we got leave permission. That, on that was one thing I just wanted to sort yeah. of jump in here because so so we know so as lawyers and I'm just going to sort of you know jump in if I get this wrong because I'm a business lawyer I'm a business trial lawyer I'm not a family lawyer but so as lawyers in Ontario we all know when you lose at trial um, then you can automatically appeal to the Court of Appeal um, in Ontario. But when you lose at the Court of Appeal, which unfortunately you did on a, on a two to one, you don't get to automatically appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada on a family law issue. You need what's called leave, which is the fancy legal word for permission. And so can you talk to us just about what, what was it, what did you have to do to get permission to appeal and what did you do to ensure that uh, because the children are still in Canada with the mom right now what did you do to ensure that that remained the case until after the Supreme Court hears this matter oh boy so as Green said for a second time we found ourselves on the losing end of a uh, an appeal decision and before we could finish reading the decision we get yet another letter saying dad's at the airport um get these kids ready we are going uh to pick them up and so we said no no we are going to be appealing this decision to the supreme court of canada and so at this point the um just to sort of contextualize the, the timing. So we did the trial, as Vereen said, in, uh, in November. We got the judge's decision in December. We went to the Court of Appeal in January. And then eight months later, the Court of Appeal releases their decision. So the Father's Council is really upset about the amount of time that has elapsed. Like it's, he considers it delay because return cases should be done in a very short period of time. So eight months later, he gets a decision. He's been successful for a second time. He's like, I'm not waiting around this time for you to you know, bring an appeal. I'm not gonna be so nice. So we had to go to the court of appeal for a second time and ask for a stay motion. So we had to ask permission to not enforce the decision uh, of the Court of Appeal to allow the children to remain in Ontario while we ask permission of the Supreme Court of Canada to hear uh, an appeal from uh, on the merits of the case, on, on the dissenting reasons of Justice Lowers. We did that in a week. Yes, yeah, so let me interject. Here. Yeah, <laughs> let me give you some background stuff. I, ha that, I have a little bit of post-traumatic stress that you from the turnaround. <laughs> let me give you some background that you wouldn't see on the paper. Paper. Yeah, and it's about the judges that we got, and and in some ways there's we like this this case these children I feel are like just divinely guided right <laughs> like there's a way in which the judge we got for the stay motion was Justice Pachaco, and Justice Pachaco had been on a panel with Justice Lowers. Remember, he's our dissenting judge. He's the judge who says I disagree with the other two, right? So you had a there was a case before ours called Jaladen and Rauda. And Jaladen and Rauda was also about Dubai. And the expert that mom had used to say that there's no best interest in Dubai was the expert that dad used in our case to say, no, no, there's best interest in Dubai. It's totally fine over there, right? And so despite that sort of contradiction and all of these other contradictions, the judges on Jaladen and Rauda were Justices Fairburn, Lowers, and Pachaco. And when you look at 
so they had spent a lot of time already thinking about this issue on that case. Then they get our case. At that time, it was called NVF because he had started it before you know, it switched to FVN. So Justice Lowers already had some background. And the stay judge is Justice Pachaco, who also has some sort of background. And he says, whoa, 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 let's put the brakes on this. These kids mm -hmm. stay here. Let, I think there's a chance that the Supreme Court might actually take this case. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of the background between yeah. the judges. So as much as we say we lost, I like to think it's a draw. We got two, <laughs> two, okay? <laughs> Yeah. Well, well I mean, judges are people, and yeah. you know, um, you know, it does sometimes depend on who we appear in front of, and and that makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. So we're talking now. August of 2021 is when you get the court of appeal decision. Um, Septem September, 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 September 2021. Okay, yeah. so. When? And so by the last week of the last week of September, so we get it a week, literally a week later, the last week of September, the 27th, we're arguing a stay motion, which means we had to submit notices of motion, we had to submit supporting affidavit evidence, we had to, you know, file a fact and we had to prepare our arguments and on show up on the appeal and tell the tell the judge to keep the kids here. And so the basis for us getting leave was we have to demonstrate that a couple of things to Justice Pachaco, we've got to say, look, we've got legitimate grounds for appeal. They are, um, in terms of these children, important issues that need to be determined. They're important in terms of public policy. So it's not only going to affect these two kids, but Canadians um, across the country. Uh, and so there are important issues that have to be addressed. And more importantly, if you return the children now and were successful at the Court of Appeal or at the Supreme Court, rather, other. you're going to have to return them again. And this back and forth shuttling of children is not in their best interests. So it would be safer to just keep them here, see if we get leave to appeal. If we do, that's fine. They can remain. If they don't, they go back to the UAE. And that really ends the inquiry right there. So he was, uh, he granted our stay motion so that the father couldn't enforce the uh, appeal decision pending our request or our, per our request for permission leave to appeal to the Supreme Court. So, yeah. Um, question, has the father been able to see the children throughout the process? Yes, he sees them twice a day on Zoom, every morning, every evening. So he sees them twice a day and he's been allowed to come and visit whenever he likes. He chose not to visit until August, but he did come in August. I think it was a week or two weeks, yes. 10 days. And then he came again in December. Um, and each time he's come, he's spent uh, lots of time with both of his kids and he sees them twice a day. So they, they're familiar with him. It's they're you know, he's all of that sort of kept in place in some uh, respect. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to talk about the leave piece yeah. to the Supreme Court of Canada. Only 10%, is it 1% or 10%? 10% 10 of cases. The Supreme Court of Canada, can't. they listen to all of the appeals from all across Canada. So everybody who's lost at a court of appeal stage um, can ask for leave, ask for permission. Will you hear me? I have a serious case. And not only it's a serious case, it's of national and public importance. It's going to be important to all of the provinces across Canada. And the, court of, the Supreme Court of Canada only takes 10% of that, those to say, yeah, yours is actually national public importance. We'll hear you. And the majority of those cases tend to be criminal to sort of uh, hear. So family law cases, they're few and far between. There were some in December, but it's been a while. I think mm. last year there, there were maybe four. Right, so uh, this is the first this year that we're aware of. Yeah. Um, so the fact that they gave us leave was kind of like, oh my God, they're hearing us. They see how important this is, you know? So there's some hope, at least we're hopeful now, especially after losing twice, that there's some hope that they will hear it and keep these kids here. But I wanna be fair to the other side as well, to Father's Council and to the majority, right? Uh, Justices Horgan and Brown, when they said, no, we agree with the trial judge, they were really focusing on what, a word that we call deference, that the trial judge, especially in family law cases, is the person who sees the parents, meets the parents, and they really focused on something called deference to say, let's, we've got to give deference to the trial judge, that he made the right calls, he made the right decisions. And so that's a lot of the argument you're going to be hearing from father's counsel. It's important that we have deference. Another type of argument they're going to have is, you allow this, 
and you're encouraging child abductions, everybody's going to be abducting to Canada and Canada is going to be a safe haven for abductors. And that's the types of arguments that they're going to be making. And the Supreme Court's going to have a hard choice. Like this is, these are really hard issues striking, you know, should best interest of children, how do we weigh the best interest of children, these children, any children before you versus child abduction and, and deterring child abduction. And they're competing policy objectives that are just going to be butting up against each other that we're asking them to consider, think about. Well, and as I understand it, and this is something I really hope that you can explain for all of us here. I saw in the materials, and as I understand it, there is a difference between a Hague Convention country and a non-Hague Convention country. And the United Arab Emirates is not a Hague Convention country. Can you just explain what that means and what the difference is uh, between the two, it, just in terms of family, not not in general. <laughs> yeah. So there is a there is a convention called the Hague Convention Against Child Abduction, and countries around the world um, have signed on to be signatories. You know what? I think I misspoke. It's actually called the Hague Convention on International Child Abduction, and countries around the world have signed on uh, to this. They've become signatories to this to say. We promise, we are firmly convinced that we will have the best interests of children as the forefront of what we do. And we promise that if a child comes here from your country, we will immediately send them back and you decide whether or not, you know, the custody and access matters. You can decide whether they should come here or not, but that should be decided in your country if you are the habitual resident. So these concepts of habitual residents and, uh, you know, these co concepts belong in Hague cases, countries that have signed on to the Hague. And there's a very small exception in Hague cases called grave risk of harm. Only if there's a grave risk of harm can we decide not to keep them. Otherwise, we're going to say mandatory return, you get to decide. Those are Hague countries. For countries that have not signed on to the Hague, for one reason or the other, their laws don't comply. They are, you know, they, they're not, they, they, their system perhaps, perhaps doesn't allow them to say best interests will be paramount because of their systems of laws, which are unique to them, grounded in whatever, you know, reasons that they've chosen their laws, be them religious or, you know, whatever is the underpinnings of their laws. So they can't say, they can't sign on to the Hague in the same way. And, and I'm just really simplifying these concepts, um, but that's really what it is. And so for non-Hague cases, now let me say, in 2018, the Supreme Court of Canada heard a case called Bailiff. We, we colloquially call it Bailiff, but it was JPB with the, OC, uh, with the OCL. And that was a Hague case where they were deciding, you know, what should decide what is habitual residence? Should it be where they were or should it be the focal point of the child's life or some kind of hybrid? So that was really in the context of when we're deciding what is habitual residence about whether to send them back, what should we do? Now that's the only Hague case the Supreme Court has ha heard and that was 2018, four, uh, four years ago. Now today, they're gonna hear a non-Hague case. The UAE is not a signatory to the Hague Convention because in their laws, the way they are, and, and Ms. Yahia can talk to them to that a bit more, they're not speaking about, there's ways in which it's not, best interest isn't first. And so for cases that are non-Hague cases, um, we're saying courts in Canada should have a different approach for many reasons. One is we can't be assured that they will uh, treat best interests of the child in the same way that we do. We can't be assured that these children's best interests will be considered. We can't be assured of reciprocity. If the shoe was on the other foot, would the UAE send the kids back here? There is no reciprocity, right? We can't be assured of undertakings, even if they promise something here. We have no way of making sure they follow it through there in the way that we do in Hague cases. So these are the types of ways in which Hague cases are very different from non-Hague cases. And so the concepts that Fadwa was talking about, right, real home, habitual residence, those are Hague concepts. Don't import them into non-Hague cases. They don't apply here. It's, it's, a, it's wrong to import them into this. So that's a question we're asking the Supreme Court. Should they be imported in here or not? Or should there be a different regime for these non-Hague cases? So just to add on to what Farine was saying, 
Canada has actually adopted the Hague Convention as part right. of the Children's Law Reform Act. So it is within the legislation. So it is our commitment that the best interests of children come first. If someone brings a child from a Hague signatory state to Canada, and this is the wrong jurisdiction, they were resident in that other uh, Hague jurisdiction, we will automatically send them back, save and accept for circumstances of serious, like a risk, grave. a grave risk of harm. So they will go back. So that's built into our legislation. For countries that are non-Hague signatories, they fall within the framework of section 23, which is our serious harm threshold, our right. own exception. Yeah. yeah, and then section 40, which provides for the return of children, okay? And uh, as Farin was saying, there's this grave risk of harm, Ours is serious risk, which is a lower threshold. It's a lower standard because in grave risk, we're saying, look, these people we know in this other state are going to apply best interest. So we don't need to worry about, you know, are the children going to be harmed? And if they are, it better be much more so than what, you know, any other state would be because we know that they're going to take the best interest of the child into consideration. So that's sort of the distinction as well. So we know uh, Canada is firmly sort of uh, committed to those principles. And this is not a hate convention case. So we're under 23 and 40 of the CL. So, so when you're talking serious harm to the children, um, can you, I mean, I saw a bit of it in the materials, but in terms of arguing that these children will have serious harm if they're returning to the United Arab Emirates, what are, what are the arguments to support that? Oh my goodness, there's so many. <laughs> well, but look, we'll we'll sort of reduce it to you know simple terms. What we are arguing is there can be many different types of serious harm, but it really depends on the children that the court is deciding about. So in some circumstances. Um, you know, their um, psychological, there might be psychological harm being removed from their primary caregiver. In other cases, it may not be the, the situation. In some cases, there may be physical harm to these children if we return them. In other cases, it may not. So it's very case specific, but we gave the court a very long list of different considerations for them to apply. So there was a case before ours called Ojikari, and Justice Laskin in the Court of Appeal said, look, you know, it the list should be as long or as short as it needs to be, but at a minimum, he identified, was it four? Yeah, four, yeah. and then citizenship as a, a yeah. potential six. So uh, go ahead and give them the list. So he gave them four factors. So yeah. he said there's risk of physical harm, risk of psychological harm, um, the infant's views and preferences, and whether the mother um, is going to be returning or not, whether the parent, yeah. it, it not, the mother was going to be returning, and then their citizenship or nationality in, in the other countries, in both countries is a factor. So for our case, um, the, the serious harm that we see and that Justice Lowers uh, who, who saw, who disagreed with the majority saw, was that the mother um, is unable to remain in the UAE. She's not a national, she doesn't have any, she has very precarious residency. She has no independent way to remain there. Um, so she's going to be deported unless she can find a way to stay there. And when, if she's deported, she'll be without the children, right? She's gonna be involuntarily separated from the children. It's sort of the, the intersecting factor there. And um, so then there's the risk of the psychological harm to the children from being separated. Uh, from their primary caregiver. As infants, the children in our case, at the time uh, were six months and three years, and today they're five and two. Mm -hmm. we, infants are anybody under the age of five is the definition of infants um, in, the, in the social science. And so infants um, don't really have an ability to express their views and preferences when you think of that third factor. Uh, but the impact on them is still quite profound. In Ojukeri, they were teenage children. And they were saying, listen, you send us back to Nigeria, we're going to have a real problem. We, we have school here. Like, so, so their views and preferences really, in some ways, really carried the day because they were really angry. They were really like there was so much um, of their feelings and the, their views and preferences were taken into consideration. So I want children to know 
um, you have voices, not choices, but it's, it's voice, not choice. But the courts do hear the voices of the children if it's appropriately through social workers and they appropriately put before the court. And so that's a factor that the courts were considering. Um, and then the Canadian, the children are Canadian citizens. The mother is a Canadian citizen. They came here every year. Her parents live here. This was like their, her, fami her familial childhood home and where they would come every year. And then economic disparity or financial insecurity. And, and that's definitely exists in this case as well. So that all favors a finding of serious harm, not to mention all the disadvantages with the UAE law, right? There's a gender inequality. There's the legal disabilities she faces. She's never going to be a decision maker in the UAE because he has guardianship. He has decision making. So what does that mean? Because I saw a lot of the material that seemed to be really turning on the technical word guardianship. And to me, it almost seemed like what it means in the UAE is very different than what it means here. Like, so if you're in the UAE, and you're living there and, and you get divorced as as the the mom do you have zero rights like everything is is the husband's rights no that that's not true but it, it is um it is uneven it's disproportionate um so look let's let's just start by saying that we're we're not here to sort of like speak poorly of other countries or their laws or systems of laws or the manner in which it's framed. And so it's not an attack on the UAE personally, uh, personally, uh, as a state, right? So, um, or any other country, quite frankly, that may have similar laws. Um, so that's an important distinction to make. What we are saying is, is that sometimes, and, and each, each country has a different variations of those laws. So the UAE has laws that are very similar to other countries in the Middle East, um, but there are variations on them. So they're not, it's not a broad stroke. We can't say that all laws from this region of the world are exactly the same or are prejudicial or you know, um, uh, you know, disproportionate between, between men and women. There are varying degrees of it. But what we're saying is, is that sometimes the effect of those laws on an individual may be harmful. That in and of itself may not be enough to be serious harm, but it's something that the court should think about. So they should really think about how are these laws in this foreign country going to affect these children. Um, and this mom. So in the UAE, there's two concepts. So I'm gonna take you back and tell you what Ontario thinks, and then I'm gonna tell you what the UAE says. So the word custody in Ontario means decision-making. And generally, both moms and dads are equally entitled to apply for custody, to be decision-makers for their children, okay? Parenting time, um, is, is called parenting time. It's called access, okay? So decision-making is custody in Ontario and parenting time is access in Ontario. Um, in the UAE, guardianship is decision-making and custody is parenting time, okay? It's the caregiving role. So custody means something else. Custody actually means parenting time in the UAE and guardianship means decision-making. The law in the UAE automatically gives decision-making authority to dads and moms automatically, or I wanna say there's a presumption in favor of, and I haven't figured out how to sort of slow that down to <laughs> make sure. It means that we're going to assume that all moms get um, parenting time with their children. They are their caregivers. And so they automatically get um, the parenting time. Right? So dads make decisions and moms take care of kids. Now, there is no function in the law in the UAE that allows moms to ever make decisions about their children. Okay, Even if a dad can't make those decisions for whatever reason, he decides he doesn't want to be a decision maker, he's incapable of making decisions, or he passes on um, other dads other his brother his father his uncle some other male relative will make decisions for those children moms are presumed to be the caregiver of children unless the father says there's some reason why they can't be so either they're unfit they're incapable um, and sometimes within the function of the law they are a different religion or they um, have a criminal 
history or they are doing something that is contrary to what the guardian decides is appropriate for the children. Mothers also lose their custody when boys turn 11 and girls turn 13. So uh, unless a judge decides that it's best for the kids to remain with mom in their care. So even though moms have caregiving of their kids, they may very well lose it. And so what parenting are, time. Yeah. Yeah. So any any decisions that mom makes in the day to day care of the children can't be contrary to what the the father says is appropriate for raising these children. So that is a concern here because, um, quite frankly, um, mom doesn't have the ability to make important decisions about her children in the same way that she would here in Ontario. And so we're saying, given that she's their primary caregiver, I think an important distinction in this case is these little kids have never spent a day outside of the care of their mom, right? So that's an important consideration for the courts here. They've never spent an overnight away from her. Dad wasn't as involved, and not to say that that's wrong, but that's just how this particular family's dynamic worked, right? Dad went to work, mom stayed at home, took care of the kids. So in this case, Ontario courts may look at that and say, you know what, mom is in a good position to make important decisions about the kids with dad, right? She knows what's best, she takes care of them every day. She has the option to do that here in Ontario. She doesn't over there. So we're asking the Supreme Court to factor that in. Take that into consideration in relation to all the other issues um, that we're saying might be harmful. In you. how you apply best yeah. interests. In, yeah. in when you, and so this is this whole issue about in Hague cases, we don't apply best interests at all because we know that the other country will. And we're saying in non-Hague cases, we can't feel the same level of confidence that they will. That's so right. we should. So in considering the best interests of these children, take into consideration. And I just, you know, what, what Fadwa was saying at the outset, let me just focus on that. The laws in the UAE are very similar to most of the laws in Europe and much of the other parts of the world, not that long ago. So yes, the laws have changed into equality. And it's sort of, you know, it, we have to sort of pause on our judgment on sort of where some of these things come from. Uh, it's not to be judgy or superior, but to just recognize that they are different. And how is it going to impact this mother, these children? Is it going to be serious harm for these children? Not to say that we're better or worse because we have equality. These, these ideas of gendered roles, fathers do decision-making, mothers do caretaking. We call them tender years until you know a certain year, mothers are better to take care of children when they're younger. These kinds of notions were also in our law not that long ago mm -hmm. and our law has evolved to a position of equality will the UAE evolve to equality possibly but let me tell you this on the 12th you're going to see Mr. Smith and he's I'll tell you this the lawyers on the other side are excellent they come from a downtown Toronto firm okay in many ways this feels a little bit like David versus Goliath <laughs> and we're the David okay but they Mr. Smith is an incredible advocate. It's it's honestly just awesome to watch him. I learned from watching him, yeah. even when he's on the other side and he's beating me up. Um, so, so I'll tell you this, he's really going to focus on how progressive Dubai is. And he's going to really make it about Dubai and not the UAE, but it's, it's all, Dubai is uh, one of the Emirates in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and so, but the UAE, as progressive as they are, as economically advanced as they are, they've declined to sign the Hague Convention, and their laws continue to have what, what Fadwa just sort of walked through in terms of um, their gendered presuppositions on how things are allocated. So they've chosen not to subscribe to the international value system. And so we're really saying, Supreme Court, examine, examine the laws, look at uh, how far they depart from ours and its impact on these people before you. I think there's just one other small point that we wanted to make as we loop it back to best interest. Um, Farine talked in the beginning that the expert that was used on a previous case in support of mom saying there is no best interest application right. was now here for dad saying actually there is. So the important <laughs> distinction that we make 
is that when best interests are looked at in the UAE, they're looked at, how do we allocate that parenting time? Can a mom continue to take care of these children or is it best for these children to have um, their parenting time governed by dad as well? So best interests only factors into the parenting time consideration, not the guardianship role, because there's no circumstances in which dads lose guardianship, but there's lots of circumstances in which a mom may. So it's really limited to that one function. And so Justice Lowers was saying, wait a minute, it's not best interests for everything. It's best right. interest for just this limited purpose. Well, and the expert in Jaladin and Rauda, she said, oh, no, 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 no. That's a different case. That mother was Christian. In this case, both parties are Muslim. And so we're saying, well, hold on. If best interest is supposed to be the paramount factor, why is religion the parent? Or are you suggesting that religion, you know, so there's this sort of like uh, confusion in our minds that hasn't been reconciled satisfactorily to us, at least. So when, when you're looking ahead to April 12th, um, what do you see as your biggest challenge to overcome? Nerves. <laughs> Nerves, yeah. Well, okay, but touching on that, both, neither of you are inexperienced litigators. I mean, you both, how long have you been called to the bar now? Oh, so 18 years, I'll tell you this, 18 <laughs> yeah. years, no, it was, well, 18 years ago since we've been called. So yeah. 19, 20, 20 years ago, we had a class together called Comparative International Family Law, and Fadwa and I sat beside each other. And then we never, we, for years, we didn't see each other. We had very different lives, yeah. very different careers, um, until the last four years where we started to work together again. And, uh, and so now we, we work together, and now we're going to the Supreme Court. So let me tell you this, for lawyers to go to the Supreme Court of Canada, it's kind of like going to the Olympics. Um, in the sense that you're really having to, to practice certain muscles uh, and really you're trying to hone those muscles and nerves are, we really, everybody is, you, you're afraid of, am I going to screw up? And it's not about screwing up so much for us. I'm like, am I going to screw up and affect these children's lives? Yeah, you know, it's everything that's that you carry with you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, when you're arguing, and, and I totally appreciate that it's unusual for both of you probably to even feel nervous going into court at this point, um, because, you, it, you know, it's something you've done so frequently, but I agree, the first time you do anything, <laughs> it's, it's walking into the unknown. So when you're walking, uh, so you're physically going to be in Ottawa, which is so exciting. Um, and when you're doing that, how many judges are you arguing in front of? So there's nine judges at the Supreme Court of Canada. The Chief Justice is Justice Wagner. We've been memorizing them, by the way, which is why Green's <laughs> going to tell you them. We have a little sticky note with like their chairs and all of their little names written underneath it. And so we've been, you know, and then trying to put the face to the name so she can tell you. Well, because, all of them. because yeah. we don't appear before yeah. them every day. No, right. I can tell you all of the Milton judges because yeah. I appear before them every day. So it's about knowing who you're appearing in front of. Yeah. If I'm going to a different court, if I'm going to appear in Welland or Niagara, I get to know the judge. Yeah. I, I try to find out as much as I can about the judge beforehand so that I have a sense of who I'm appearing before. Yeah. And so it's no different here, yeah. right? So Je Chief Justice Wagner sits in the middle, and then you have Justice Moldaver, um, and beside Justice Moldaver is Justice Cote, who's from uh, so from Quebec. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of Justice Wagner, you typically have Justice Karakatsanis and Justice Brown. And then um, during COVID, they sort of been sitting on two levels. So on the lower level, well, I don't know that it's a lower level, same level, but um, below them, <laughs> um, on you've got um, Justices Casarere and Justices Rowe, and then Justices Martin, and uh, Justice Jamal. So Justice Martin has been the one who's written on family law in the past. Uh, so she re wrote on uh, a two, well, a number of cases. There's the case of Michelle and Graydon is, is they all, several judges wrote, but uh, her, her writing on Michelle and Graydon really spoke to family law lawyers in terms of why we do what we do, what child support, it was a child support case. You know, why do we have child support? What do these obligations mean? It's a really fabulous read, Michelle and Graydon, um, for family law lawyers. And, um, and Justice Jamal, who is the most recent appointment to the bench, um, he sat in the Court of Appeal, the same way that we had Jaladin and Rauda, there was a case called MAA and DEME, where um, he was on the panel 
uh, that he was one of the three judges on MAA and DEME with Justice Bonato, who wrote the decision and chose not to send the children back to Kuwait in that case. So um, in this corner, there's we, we are hopeful, we feel some level of understanding, if not support. And uh, But I'll tell you, a question from any one of these nine judges, on the, on the 12th, when they ask a question, you can damn bet that as much as we've been in court hundreds of times, there's still a piece of us that's going, oh my God, oh my God, they're asking a question, oh my God. <laughs> so when you're, when you're starting to prepare for the case like this, we're just entering into our last five minutes just to, to give you a sense here, but when you're preparing for a case like this, are you preparing to answer questions from any of the nine panelists or do you anticipate that it will be specific judges? No, any nine. nine. Yeah. All, I'll tell you in the past, all nine judges have asked questions of both of both sides and often both people who are speaking on both sides they're and they're really good thoughtful questions they're very difficult questions that go to the heart of the issue we're talking about the nine brightest minds in the country um, and it's going to impact you know not just the the parties in front of them but Canada as a whole so they have to really confront the difficult questions, which Farine identified at the beginning, which is if we let these um, two children remain, are we inviting other people to abduct? Are we sort of creating this framework that if you have small children, if you come from this region of the world, if you, you know, if you have, um, um, if you're their primary caregiver, that suddenly you've got basically carte blanche or just, you know, an open door policy, come on in, we'll let you stay, versus how do we balance that with the important objective, which the Supreme Court has said in numerous decisions before, that where the children are the focal point of the inquiry or the, or the issue before us, that we have to take their best interests as our paramount or most important consideration. So it's a really difficult exercise now, weighing those two objectives. Now, um, having been granted leave by the Supreme Court to hear this issue, does that give a suggestion to you that they're open to ruling in your favor or is that just wanna make a decision one way or the other? When they grant leave, it's three judges. So in the same way, I would assume that at, le hope, at least two of the three said, this is an interesting case we want to hear. Let's hear some more about it before we decide. It could have been three. It could have been two. It would have to be at least two. We don't know which two. In our leave decision, Justice Moldaver signed it. So we know Justice Wagner didn't hear it because he would have been uh, more senior. So of the three, we don't know who the other two were but we know Justice Moldaver was one of the three in our leave panel. Um, does that mean Justice Moldaver is sympathetic to our case? We have no idea. It could have been the other two that yeah. said yes, and he could have been the dissenting voice. Yeah. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Maybe when he asks us questions, he's satisfied or unsatisfied. Maybe when he asks them questions, he's, you know, so we, we have no idea, which is part of where the nerves come from. <laughs> It's not an easy case, right? Like we recognize that it's there's a lot to be said for the other side's position. You know, he is their dad. He loves them. He wants, you know, to be in their lives. Um, and, and so there is there's concern there. Um, so you have competing interests of two parents who obviously love their children very much. So that's an important thing to take into consideration. Uh, I think that one of the last points before I, I wanted to touch on it was you had asked why we initialize like why do we ask okay. refer to them as yes. um, in initials and and that's um, uh, a recent trend that sort of happened we normally refer to parties by their last names um, but in these circumstances where privacy concerns are at play and where we have small children we initialize we use initials in order to uh, protect the privacy of the individuals and the parties particularly the children. So you'll see a publication ban on this in the sense that you can't, uh, the actual names of the parties have been blanked out and anything that would sort of link them to it. Um, in this case, dad's uh, employer is also uh, subject to, a, is he? The publication ban? He, he was removed. removed. Yeah. So um, will we notice that when you're arguing on the 12th? Yes. Yes. 
We don't refer to them by by same as today. Yeah, we'll probably be calling her the mother or the appellant, probably the appellant, right? right. And him the father. Um, you know, I'll I'll tell you this is a tidbit, and I, just in terms of this being a really tough case, right? It's it's it, this is a tough case for the judges. It's been a tough case for us. It's been it's a tough tough case, and mobility cases are really hard, right? Like the argument that sort of we're making is what choice does she have, right? Like. Um, she's a Canadian divorced woman there, which means she she has no family there, and you know she she has limited rights with respect to her children, as Fadwa was saying. She has no place to live, no security, and could be forced to leave the country without her children. So she comes home with them. But uh, we had a settlement conference before Justice Kurtz, who is a um, Milton judge here, very experienced family law judge. And he, as he heard all of our arguments, uh, you know, as we're getting ready for the trial, he said, he, he takes us all aside and he says, we were hoping, or there was some idea that maybe he'd move closer because he can work here. He can work in New York. He has, his office has, his, his company has an office in New York. So could he be closer? And Justice Chris said, listen, mom's not going there. Dad's not coming here. So both of you go to the UK go somewhere else where you can both live. You know, here's a solution. Yeah. Because these are such hard cases. There isn't a middle ground. And Justice Kerr's I, credit to him for being really <laughs> creative with a solution that may have solved the problem here. But both of these parents are very, I don't know if stubborn is the right word, but very fixed in the fact that that what they're doing is right for their kids. And both of them feel like what they're doing is right for their kids. That's why it's- well, so I'm sure that everyone is going to argue on the 12th very, very strenuously for the position they represent. Mm -hmm. I wish you both luck. I also wish luck to the respondents because that's the only right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you for everyone who has joined us and for everyone who is viewing this video in the future because I know it's going to be a fantastic resource. Thank you so much. And we will be watching you on the 12th, but that shouldn't add to your nerves. You guys are going to do a great <laughs> job. So thank you all so much. We hope this has been helpful. It has been. Goodbye. Take care. Bye.